Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santonetti. And on today's broadcast, I want to talk to you about an interesting uh, title that God has put in my heart, but it's in the Bible. I began to study it, and it's just interesting. It's called This Side of the Jordan. This Side of the Jordan. And uh, I want to share a few things before we get into the text, because it's so important. You know, we don't understand many things, and we have to be honest about that. We don't know a lot of things, and we can't unravel every mystery. I mean, we can't look into the depths of the earth, you know, at least most of us, and discover what is there. But our heart hungers for the deep things of God, at least it should, right? Do you hunger for the deep things of God? You know, as a child, I grew up, you know, basically in a religious home, but it wasn't really religious to the point where they spoke about God a lot. You know, it was sporadically and um, in a religious way. So they never really clarified who God is or was because they didn't have the knowledge. Everybody spoke, well, this is more or less what God means to me. But as a little child, you know, maybe five, six, seven years old, had this interest whenever I heard the name God, Jesus, heaven, there was something moving inside of me. It was a mystery. I didn't understand it. I could not even fathom it. But it was fascinating, nonetheless. I knew there was something there, but I had no idea. And I remember once on Easter Day, I'm sure I shared this with you before, my sister and I went to church. It was Easter. I had a nice little suit on. I still remember, you know, the suit. And um, after the service, we went around big Catholic church, gigantic. That's You know, I grew around uh, the church, Riverside Church is still there, very famous and gigantic church. Right across the street is... Um, Grant's tomb and so you know pretty famous place and so we walked around and there are many little chapels that you can visit if you don't go to the service you can always have a time of prayer so we walked by one and I was really intrigued by it and so I uh, you know went through the doors and I began to walk down the middle aisle my sister she stood outside she was just looking at me and I went down the aisle and I was amazed at the structure inside, how big it was, and of course, all the beautiful paintings and all that stuff. I knew one thing in my mind. God is big. That's all I knew, that God was massive. And so I was walking slowly down the aisle, looking at these things, and I was amazed. And then I came back slowly. And when I got to my sister, she was like, you know, chuckling. Not in a bad sense, but just chuckling. And so I said, what, what are you laughing? Why are you laughing? She said, you look like you were going to get married. Little, little did I know and little did she know that I did get married. I married God that day and he married me. And I'll never forget that experience. And a lot of little things like that happens to us throughout life that we, we think about. If we contemplate God has always been there. And he gives us this remembrance because he wants us to see him and to recognize that he is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that starts it. He's the one that finishes it. And so I knew that God was big. And those things happen to us. I want you to think about Israel. I want you to think about the fact that Israel came out of Egypt. And they were still on this side of the Jordan. In other words, they did not cross over into the promised land. Not yet. I have a little saying that says, and whenever I get a chance, I tell people, don't build a life of regret. It burns like hell. Now, I want to ask you a question before we move on. Have you ever had a time when you did something that burns regrettably inside of you. When you think about it, it burns. Now, all of us have had experiences like that. And we all make mistakes. 
and we all regret those mistakes. Then there are other times that we should have done something to improve our lives, but we didn't do it. You know, the opportunity arised, but we miss it. And every time we think about it, we have regret. And it burns. The shame, the pain, it burns. So, if you had listened to that still, small voice, maybe you and I would be in a different place, in a different way, doing different things. God has a way of bringing us to where He wants us. Not everything we do in life is God. But He takes us slowly. So yeah, regret burns like hell. I can imagine the heart of the new generation of Israel as they contemplated getting ready to enter into the promised land. You know, the land of milk and honey. That generation knew what had happened to the generation before them. You know, their parents, their grandparents, and why they didn't enter into the promised land. Going up from the desert and growing up in the desert was not easy, especially for children. Imagine the stories in the attendance of their parents, the little ones, how they were learning the law of God. But every once in a while, as you can just, just picture it, maybe one or two children sitting by the door of the tent, and as they were hearing the, the word of God, they look out and they can see the promised land. They grew up that way. But can you imagine that one day one of the children says, Mom, how come we don't go live over there? I mean, it's, it's much greener. It's more beautiful. How come we can't go there and live? And regrettably, the parent has to say, it's because we didn't listen to God. We disobeyed Him. You know, the words of Isaiah, the prophet, rings so strong, even right now, when you think about it. And I love the way the Good News Bible puts it. If you only obey me, you will eat the good things of the land or the land produces. But if you defy me, you are doomed to die. I, the Lord, have spoken. So can you imagine... The people at that time, living by the mountain or on the mountain of Nebo, looking at Jerusalem from Nebo, at the future destiny, the city that is the center of the universe, right before their eyes, and they couldn't touch it. Let me ask you, have you ever had a thought, just for a moment, that God has something great for you? You can see it with your spiritual mind. You can... You can envision it. You can envision it and wonder about it, yet unable to grasp it because of something that was done that does not allow you to have it now in life. Yeah, I think we all go through that. Let's get to the text because that's the most important thing right now. The text is found in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1. And it says, These be the words which Moses spoke unto all Israel on this side, Jordan, in the wilderness of the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban, or Laban, and Hazaroth and Dezahab. The reason I'm so intrigued about this particular verse is because I began to study it a while back. And as I looked at all the letters and the words, I'm looking at them and I'm, I'm intrigued about what God is saying here. I've maybe written over 117 pages, something like that. So it's impossible for me to share everything on this side of the Jordan, if you know what I mean. But I would like us to couple this, couple this with another verse of scripture. And it's in Matthew. And we're looking at chapter 3. And I'm just going to read from verse 1. 
verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent you, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his highway, his path straight, level ground. And the same John had his remnant of camel's hair and a leather girdle or belt about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then when, then he went out to Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and he baptized, watch this, and were baptized by him in Jordan, confessing their sins. God left them knowing that the Messiah would come later on and that he would bring the people from that side of the Jordan into his promised land, the kingdom of God. The people in the desert were parked there for 40 years. Wow, that's a long time. That's a long time. And yet, they saw the promised land. They saw the good things that God had for them, but they knew they could not enter and would not dare to defy God again because they knew that God would bring judgment upon them, but imagine not being able to enter that which they saw with their eyes. And you Sometimes you say, Lord, how come, how come I can't have that? He says, it's because you disobeyed me. It's because you don't walk in the way that I have prescribed for you. It's because you're not paying attention to that still, small voice that I have placed inside of you. Hmm. The only way that we can serve the Lord is by truth. I like what Psalm 16 verse 8 says. It says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. The fundamentals are found in the Hebrew word within this text, and it's Shava. Don't forget it. Shava. I have set. Shava. Let that word ring in your spirit today and forever. When you think about the Lord and having set him in his rightful place in your life, Shava, meaning to be leveled, equalized, to be adjust, to have a counterbalance. The theme of our lives should be, I have set Shava. The Lord would have us put him before everything in our lives. How can we experience that glorious presence in our lives if we do not shava the Lord? This is why they failed. Because although they came out of Egypt, Egypt never came out of them. Oh yeah, you could take a person and put, listen, give them a bath, put brand new clothes on them, give them a haircut, give them a house, give them a car, everything that is essential and beyond in this, in this world. And yet the inside is still defiled. I look at Christianity today and a lot of it is just bells and whistles. It looks like gold, it glitters like gold, but it doesn't have the dignity of the gold. That's not what God wants. And he parked them on that side, the other side of the promised land by the Jordan. And I want you to look at it, Israel. For the next 40 years, I want you to look at it and have regret in your spirit about you disobey me. Yeah. Sometimes we go through things and I hear Christians say, that's not God that he would have them suffer. Well, folks, I got news for you. God knows what we need to draw us near. And how can we cross that Jordan except we understand that we have to obey God? For 40 years, they stood on the other side. What great pain. The only two people that would enter into that in that generation would be Joshua and Caleb. 
Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim, meaning the fruitful one, or fruitful, and Caleb from the tribe of Judah. God shall be praised. God, even in their name, set the fact that these are the only two that are going in. Judah, because they will praise me, and Ephraim, because they will have the fruit of my holiness inside of them. I want to ask you a question. Because this was the time now. Before the question, this was the time in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, that God was going to re-give the law to them a second time. See, this chapter teaches us about the failure that happened because of disobedience. Israel paid a great price as they were in the desert for 40 years. That generation slowly died until the new generation was ready to go in to possess the land of Canaan. It is as though God said, thus far and no more, my people. God gave them the law a second time to renew the covenant, to renew them and give them a sense of purpose and destiny. And here's the worst part of it. I want to ask you the question, what do you do when you fail and do not enter into something that God has for you, but because you fail, I fail. We teach our children our failures so that they hopefully will avoid it. They didn't do that. Parked for 40 years in the desert, they didn't do one thing, and that is they did not circumcise their sons on the eighth day. The covenant given to Abraham way before that, they didn't keep the covenant of circumcision. And before they entered into Jericho, because you know the story, they did go through the Red Sea, uh, through the Jordan, excuse me, through the Jordan eventually. And what happened there was a memorial. When they finally were getting ready to go over the sea, God said to them, I want you to circumcise your children after they got to the other side. Before they went to Jericho, circumcised all the men because they had not been circumcised before they crossed the Jordan. God allowed them to cross the Jordan and he did something spectacular. Now listen, we know that they had their feet at the Jordan, the priests with the Ark of the Covenant. And as they stepped into the water, the water began to part. And then the priests went to the middle of the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant. And when all the people passed by, I love what Joshua did. He went to where the priests were and he took 12 stones and he placed them there in the middle of the Jordan. And then they crossed over and the Jordan closed. Those 12 stones that represent Israel were now covered in the water of the Jordan. But then he took 12 stones after that and he put them on the land so that they could tell their children when they said what are these 12 stones for they the people will tell the stone the, the story of the jordan and how they failed and how they came through and how god gave them a second chance watch this but the stones that were in the middle of the of in the middle of the jordan they could not see you see john came baptizing from the desert, he came from the desert and he began to preach the message of repentance to come, be baptized, get into the water and let that old person stay in the water. And they were baptized and the Messiah came and he submitted himself to the ministry of John the Baptist, not to be baptized for sin, but to be identified in righteousness with the ministry of John the Baptist. He came to approve the ministry of John the Baptist. And I don't know about you, but I want Christ in my ministry. I want Christ to be the center of my ministry and to say, I have approved your ministry in righteousness. And the Messiah came out of the water and he began to preach and do miracles. And I love this. You see, baptism 
It's only the identification that we have experienced something on the inside by the Messiah and left the old man in the water, just like the 12 stones in the water as a memorial. I am dead. I am obedient to God. And coming out of the water, those stones speak about the memorial, about our testimony. Repent, because the kingdom of God is among you. And if you receive that, you are walking around with the kingdom of God inside of you. If you receive that, you have the kingdom of God being expressed through your life. You have passed from that side of the Jordan to this side of the Jordan. And now God says, I have a plan for you. Don't mess it up. Be obedient to what I tell you and know that I will be in the midst of you. I will bless you if you simply obey my words. God bless you. Have a wonderful, spirit-filled day. And until we meet again, shalom.